I mean, Terry, Terry was a was an absolute uh, gen genius lyricist, wasn't he? Yeah, he was yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And all of those, you know, the lunatics are taking, taking over the asylum. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's bad. I, I started. It's funny, right? Because when it all started with the body popping, the first thing it was Jeffrey Daniels and Shalimar doing with a balloon, yeah, and giving it all that and the wall. Yeah, the wall so, we did, so we did that. I did all that. I mean, like when I was sixteen, I was going chicken in Sandringham Road. Uh, chicken sound system. Um, his son, wow. Chicken son, was one of my mates. Wow. So I'd go in there. I got on the mic a couple of times. I said, no, well, I don't rap on hip hop anymore. I rap on house. And he's got no one raps on house. I'm like, no, I do. Oh, uh, still a lot of wear out. Oh, yeah, so and... London was a dump. Uh, like you know, like like in, all around King Street was all like derelict warehouses. Like at King's Cross, there are eight warehouses. You couldn't do that now. They're all off the place. Then we already right? had craft work and new, new order and all that electronic stuff was all in the balance, wasn't it? It was only a matter of time once house music came and that little white pill with a little dove stamp on it. That was it. <laughs> all those came over. I mean, there were so many. I mean, your Voodoo Ray. Oh, you know, a guy oh, called Gerald. Yeah. You know, as soon as you heard that, bang. And uh, bum. got caught in it and got dragged under. Bless him. Uh, and uh, that was almost that, that, that must that it. must have hit, hit you all very hard. It did. It did. Mm. It was very difficult. Mm, I got yeah. to bong 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 bong, and I was hearing it, and I was just seeing all these shapes coming out of the speakers, and he was going plink blonk and all that. He <laughs> saved so many of us. You know, I'd have been in and out of jail if it weren't for music. That was madness. Uh, you know, 70,000 people in front of us headlining on the Saturday night on the enemy stage. The, big, the bridge broke into the field. There was so much pandemonium going on. Wow. And we formed a telepathic community that night. Uh, my mind blew Obviously. my own mind. So Don't... we have music producer and DJ who stirs up the crowd into a frenzy with his killer sets. He was in the early 90s group who bought us tracks like Ebenezer Good, Forever People, Boss Drum and many more uh, called The Shaman and was co-owner of that wicked nightclub uh, called The End and run an electronic dance label called Plink Plonk and I'm excited to say we have the multi-talented you could say kind of like a jack of all trades we've got the one and the only Mr C in the back yes! <laughs> How you doing bruv? Woo! Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah, man. This is it's an honour. Yeah, good to be here. In the back, you're a lovely, spacious taxi. I know, you've, take, you've <laughs> taken that back seat up in style. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're Spread rolling. Spread up. You're ro Spreading you're, up. <laughs> you're, ro <laughs> you're, ro you're rolling with the legends. Yeah, was it man spread? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Get your man spread yeah. on. Listen, man, it's an absolute <laughs> honour. And uh, we're going to take it back, back to the start, back to where it all kind of started for you. Yeah. And uh, anyone watching this, please share this around the socials. Share, 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 share. share. share he makes he and all that, innit? Yeah, share this around because what you're about to hear is going to, you know, it's going some serious history is going to be um, going to be told. So, um, Rich, it's an honour to have you in the back. And uh, first, I thought I'd bet you say that to all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> oi, oi. <laughs> <laughs> Get on the right note. <laughs> ready on the right, ready on the left, ready on the firing line. Yeah, but no, it's, it's a real honour to have you in the back. Thanks, and um, you know, first two questions I always kick it off with with my interviews is you know, you know where are you from and what was it like growing up? You know, as a kid. And I'm from here. I'm from like well, Islington, Holloway. I was born in. Uh, um, actually, just round the corner in uh, Cliss Old Park for the first six months of my life. Mm. Born in Whitechapel Hospital, actually. Oh, was um, that? Even though my mum lived in, in Cliss Old Park. Um, and then, like, yeah, say for six months. And then Drayton Park, just round here. Round the corner. Uh, just off Holloway Road there for, for, until I was five. Mm. And then uh, just off Hornsey Road near the Arsenal Stadium yeah. for a year and a half and then just up on Camden Road for a few years by the by the Brettnock, York Way yeah, and yeah. then after that just, just the next road up, Hungerford Road just off of York Way there and then a bit further up Corrin Road off of Brettnock up the top by Southwell Park Wow, so, so this is kind Islington, of, all around yeah. Islington This is like your, your, your old stomping This ground. is my manor, my brother lives two streets around the corner there my sister lives just the other side of the stadium So so obviously you're, you're Arsenal supporter? Uh, no, Chelsea Oh, you Chelsea? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I couldn't do it I went to all the way school, 1300 Gooners and me <laughs> I just couldn't do it Now when I was like uh, little, like eight years old I was a bit, you know, kid, little kid, you're stupid you don't know what you're doing and that. So I supported Leeds United. I just didn't want to be all my mates were all gooners. Yeah. I had a few Tottenham. My mum was Tottenham. 
bless her. Uh, my uncle and cousin are Tottenham. Both my brothers are Arsenal. All my mates are Arsenal. A few Tottenham. And I just didn't want to be the same as everyone else. I thought, oh, I'll go Leeds United. <laughs> and I did that for a couple of years. Uh, went to a few games with Leeds. But I was always looking for a London club. And uh, um, I went over Chelsea. It was uh, se season 76-77. Mm. And the first, ga f first game I went to was uh, Nottingham Forest at home. And we were both fighting for promotion. Both won promotion that year. And uh, that was my first game. Forest went 2-1 up. Uh, uh, sorry, 1-0 uh, up and Chelsea come back 1-2-1, one, one. Division 2 was really horrible, I was in Gate 13, East Stand Low, I was all full of horrible monsters, yeah, yeah. and I thought, oh I like this, <laughs> and that was it, I was hooked, dropped leads like a ton of hot bricks, and be, that was it, Chelsea, and Chelsea. Of, yeah, just turned 11. I'll tell you what though, it was a different time back then, wasn't it, back in, when was that, the 70s? Yeah, uh, well, like, basically, yeah, 70, 77, 76, 77 it was, for my first game. Um, so yeah, it was, yeah, 70s, going to, like, mid, mid to late 70s for my early days going to football. And then by the time we got to 80, 81, 82, I was every game, I loved it. So you got bang, bang into it? Good fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what you know, as a kid, you know, what kind of uh, music was you kind of growing up on? I mean... Well, well, we all listen to like you know, always listen to good music. Like when I was thirteen, I was a rude boy. That was my first proper fashion thing. Before that, I was listening to things like ABBA and all that. You know what I mean? But which I suppose got me into disco. But yeah. like at thirteen, I got into Scar. You know, specials. Uh, Terry Hall's just passed. Bless oh, him. I was I just just about to. Yeah, say, I was going to say that. That, that, that specials <laughs> album is my favourite album ever. I think that first one. I um, yeah. love the madness as well. They were local boys. They from Harvest Estate. And like, they used to practice in. In the block of flats and that, I went to see them 13 years old in the open end around here and up the street. Um, so that was all good and fun and games for a year or two. And then, uh, like, grew me air out and got back into the casual boy thing and was listening like to soul, reggae, funk, dub, ska, disco, black music, basically. Yeah, jazz, yeah, yeah. funk, and soul, soul boy. And what we got to say as well, actually, to, uh, keeping with the specials, obviously, Terry's just passed, but yeah. we got to say a big RIP to Terry Hall. Yeah. Because what, what an absolute talent, you know. Yeah, I mean, brilliant. the specials, Fun Boy Free. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, that Faith and Hope and Charity. Oh, that, faith, that was an absolute, hope and charity. It was like a rare groove classic, wasn't it? Yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we got to say a massive RIP to Terry Hall because yeah, we, we've sad. lost a real legend now. Very sad. Very, very sad. So, big RIP. Making sure my old dog and bones off. Which yeah. it is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, Ter Terry was a, was an absolute uh, gen genius lyricist, wasn't he? Yeah, he was yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And all of those, you know, the lunatics are taking, taking over the, the asylum. asylum. Yeah. He's a bad boy. But I like, you know, with the specials as well. I mean, you know, they were all, they're all bad boys. They're a very good group. But my favourite group ever, like I say, for like non-electronic music. And did you, you know, did you get into that kind of like electro um, bang into it hip hop sound? Bang into it, like well, that was it. Like well, that was like sort of seventy uh, seventy nine. Seventy nine, I was in seventy nine and eighty. I was into ska, but I also used to listen to a bit of soul and funk and disco. So when the electro very first started, like eighty one. I was like all over it. I mean, I was already like when I was 13, Rapper's Delight came out, and I was all like all over that. It was 1977 or 70 something like that. But they were a manufactured band. But yeah, when it like Africa by Bart and the Soul Sonic Falls and Egyptian well, when Planet, Lover, Planet, and, Planet Rock, yeah, Rock. Planet Rocks, all the Planet Rock stuff, yeah, uh, Planet Patrol, like Planet Al Hashim the Soul, Al Nafish, yeah, Rock Nafish, Al Nafish, bang into it. That was right up my street. So yeah, that I went from like that, and uh, I was into that and disco. I mean, a little bit of New Order around then, but I was more into the black sound, so the electro and the disco and the soul and the funk and dub and reggae and all that was for me. You absolutely loved it. Yeah. And keep on that kind of electro or that kind of early rap hip hop stuff. I mean, you know, um, did you get, do any kind of graph or body popping, breaking? Yeah, well, I did. I, did. I started, it's funny, right? Because when it all started with the body popping, the first thing it was Jeffrey Daniels and Shalimar doing with a balloon yeah. and uh, giving it all that. And the wall. Yeah, the wall so, we did, so we did that. I did all that, and then um, after that came the uh, no. Actually, before that was the robot. When was robot? Giving, we yeah. Was giving it all that. Remember? Yeah, Rich, you remember the robot. cup of tea? Do you remember the cup of tea move? You like made that you was like pouring. Yeah, exactly. Cup you of know tea. exactly. We did all that, yeah. and uh, so yeah, from there to the Jeffrey Daniels with a balloon, yeah. and then uh, then body popping came in, and it all started to get a little bit more like that. And then the breaks dancing started. I weren't very good. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I was yeah. all right at body popping and locking and that. You weren't like, 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 as long as I'm on my feet, but. Uh, 
<laughs> Why, it's a bit thin. It's always been a bit thin. Well, it would if you was busting like, the old that, head. Anything that was spinning on the head yeah. was going to be out of the question. There's no way I'm spinning on my head. So I was like, <laughs> no. And I've never been supple. All that. So all that, all the windmill and all that spinning around and all that malarkey weren't really for me. But that was when I started rapping. I was like, going to say, yeah, so, so with the rapping, I mean... Who was kind of inspiring you as a rapper? Because I know you know you all, the, all those originals that we talked about. You know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, of course. Curtis Blow. And Curtis Blow. He was yeah. one of the originals. He, he was he, one of you know. Um, and I like he was like, he done also a lot of the Washington Go Go sort of stuff. But he was an original Curtis Blow. But yeah, like Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde and H the Houdini? Jazzy Five. Houdini. And, yeah, Houdini. Yeah, yeah. All that. So that was my inspiration for rap, really. But Grandmaster and Flash and the Furious Five, Melly Mel, all them boys. They were the top boys for me they were amazing yeah, weren't they? I, I love them um, so that was a big inspiration i mean rich, rich that that tune the message yeah how good was the message brilliant absolutely brilliant and it's funny because that was around the time i started writing lyrics mm. um you know 82 and i did that with my mate he, he lived up in mulber road robert robert yeah and like he's a dj and he's like let's start rapping because that was like we needed to stay ahead of all these kids that were doing all the break dancing so i would start rapping so he's like all right well, so we're both writing lyrics while i was writing lyrics he wasn't he was actually copying lyrics from a, a, a now very famous new york rapper called buster rhymes Right, so he's copying all Buster Rhymes lyrics because Buster Rhymes hadn't had any records released. So no one knew here who, who Buster Rhymes was. So he's just copying his lyrics. So I'm keeping up with him. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, writing yeah, all yeah. my lyrics to keep up. And I was going blow for blow with him. I was keeping <laughs> up, which was good. I think he kept me on my toes. Like with him nicking Buster Rhymes, he only did it for a laugh. He weren't a rapper, you know what I mean? And then he's come, he, he's come clean. He's gone, Rich, he's ain't me. He's, I'm not Buster Rhymes. It's a New York rapper. I've been copying off of this tape. But your lyrics are bad boy, and that was it. I was in. You was hooked. Was 16, 17, yeah. Like 17, I started like blagging my way into clubs. I did CB breakers clubs and that first, mm. like because everyone was on the CB radio. It was like yeah. having Facebook, wasn't it? Remember that? Yeah, everyone was on CB radio. So yeah. you know, you everyone used to meet up CB clubs in pubs or community centres and have a disco and all that. So I'd get on the mic at them places and that. And then like my first proper club was in Tenerife when I was seventeen. Oh, was it? Yeah. Wow. And in terms of rapping, you know, was you rapping in like at the time back then, like in an American accent? No. Oh, so you? Well, no, actually, no. Well, my first rap, it was sort of in an American accent a little bit, but not really. I mean, I always had my normal accent, and you know, obviously, certain words are going to come into play, like dope and do you, you know, sort of American slang words. But <coughs> I've always sounded kind of British, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, but like I say, when you could just go in at it and rapping party lyrics, no, it's just my normal accent, but when you're in a flow, I guess some words might sound a little bit American, but not really. Yeah, you're more think, like that kind yeah, of Yeah, uh, I mean, like, like, I always had people say one thing I like about you when you get on the mic is you don't try and sound American. Mm. Which is nice, so you're keeping that kind of in Yeah, well, I'm, I'm one of the last of the few remaining cockneys, aren't I, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, like, they don't really exist anymore, do they? No, not really. Right. All the cockneys have all moved out, there's only the only of us left. They moved out to the suburbs. Yeah. Did, did you, uh, was you watching films as well? You know, like uh, films like Wild Style and Beach Street? And I was, yeah. I saw all those Beach Street and Wild Style and all that. Yeah, I was mm. bang into it. Hip-hop culture, disco culture. It was a one thing for us growing up. It wasn't a, like, oh, you was just in a rare groove or you was just into disco or yeah. you was just into hip hop or you was just into electro or you, you it was all of it it all came mm. together it was all dance music it all, and, it all, it all blended into yeah, one didn't and, it and, and even yeah even when it went down to like the ballads and soul music and like and then de re reggae and dance hall and all that it was all yeah obviously you know it was you was either a reggae boy or a soul boy kind of thing but if he was a soul boy he was into disco and electro and rap and if he was a reggae boy he was into scar and dance hall and lovers and rock steady and do you know what i mean Big so time. it was yeah it and was, do you remember something did you go to some of them kind of blues parties yeah i did I was, I was a regular I, I mean like when i was 16 i was going chicken in sandringham road uh, chicken sound system um his son wow. chicken son was one of my mates wow. so i'd go in there i got on the mic a couple of times yeah you know, doing like chatting some lyrics i wasn't that good at chatting reggae really i was all right i'd get away with it but you, you, but you I'd, I'd get on the mic and chat some lyrics and have big rouse to make are you that no way why i'm like yeah mate and then why, why are you talk so hard? Because that's how we talk in London, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kept it, kept it on that, that, rap, on yeah. that rap style. Yes, yeah, so I was more a rapper than I was a chatter. And before, you know, before house music really kind of kicked off, yeah. you know, the, the underground clubs were playing, you know, a lot of like, uh, a lot of funk, 
It was everything. Um, it, mean, was, it was everything, yeah, it wasn't was it? It was everything. I mean, like, I used to knock about, um, I used to work with LWR Radio uh, before I was a DJ. And I was a rapper, and I was rapping with uh, Jasper the Vinyl Junkie, and I used to do lots of the gigs that he did, uh, like from that uh, cricketers in Chertsey and like you know, West End Wardour Street Club. Mm. I can't remember the name of it now, but like, and then also uh, Ron Tom, um, he was one of the main boys from the LWR Soul Syndicate, um, the original Funky Dread, and uh, he, uh, he actually used to live around the corner from me in Tuffnell Park, and we were mates. So like when he started doing really well for himself, I was like, yeah, and he, uh, he brought me in. Then um, I used to rap for him, we used to do camis over in Hackney, Homer and I Street, camis, and uh, Cotton Club, and Stoke Newton I Street. Uh, yeah, and, I, um, and generally wherever Ron Tom was going, I was there, de like emceeing. I'd, sometimes I'd warm up for him a little bit, but I wasn't a DJ; I was a rapper. Uh, so yeah, I was doing that with Ron Tom and, and Jasper the Vinyl Junkie. Wow! Uh, for like eighty four, eighty five. Okay, going back to that that, that early early yeah, year. I yeah. mean, who was you basically rating on the old Gregory's? on the old uh, Gregory Pex on well, the decks? Well, I used to like all sorts of people when I was a rapper. I used to work with Dave Durrell at yeah. the Raw, YMCA at oh, the Raw. Oh, did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, used to, I used to rap with him, with Dave Durrell. Uh, I rapped a little bit with um, uh, the, the Zoo Boys. Uh, what was Steve, it? Bobby and no, Steve? No, uh, the, no, who did the Do at the Zoo. Oh, what do they the called? Well, they, oh, uh, what, special, the, special Branch. No, what? no, well, Special Branch was Nicky Holloway, wasn't it? Uh, no, no, I can't, I can't. they 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 went down from Kingston way. Yeah, no, that's um, Bobby and Steve. No, that's not Bobby and Steve. No, no, no. Hold on, Ben and Andy. Yeah, Ben, ben and Andy. Andy. Yeah. Ben and Andy. Yeah. Boiler house. Boiler house. Boiler there house. you go. Boiler house. Uh, they used to do, do at the zoo and all that. But I saw anyone so watching little... this. Sorry, our memories yeah. like a bit. Oh yeah, we're a bit faded. Uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, Boiler House lot. So yeah, I used Order. to work. I used to mix it up. I used to work all, all around with different sorts of people as a rapper. Do you know what I mean? But you know, people. I used to love going out to uh, like Africa Centre, Soul to Soul. I used yeah. to go to the Norman Jay's warehouse parties, uh, Shake and Finger Pop. I used to do parties with Judge Jewel. Family, family function. Family function. Family yeah, function. Shake and yeah. Finger Pop. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go to them. They were uh, wicked. They were. They were wicked. Um, yeah. So that that was my thing, really, like jazz, funk, and soul, and. You know, I, you know, so I loved all that. Do it uh, that that thing that used to do new ambassadors with Kiss FM when they first started with Tosca. Yeah, you remember him, Tosca. Yeah, Tosca. I mean, that was, you're going into eighty like, six now. They were going into house music territory, but before that, it was like yeah, that they were my boys. Like they were mostly the LWR lot, Jasper and Ron Tom. Uh, yeah, they they were the boys that were killing it for wow, me. Wow, wow. And what what made you? You know, what made you want to kind of become a DJ? Well. I don't know really. I mean, I just enjoyed it anyway. Like, um, there'd be a few times I'd DJ at the Cotton Club when Ron Tom couldn't make it. He had another gig that was for more money, so I'd just go and cover for him and do that. You know, um, I just always, you know, always enjoyed love it, the, the love of soul, funk, disco, and all that. So um, I made my first house tune in '86, end of '86, with Eddie Richards, and it was funny because I went to Camden Palace, and it must have been the end of '84. And Chris Forbes was DJing with Colin Favor, and I went up and I called Colin Favor over, mm. and he's come over. I said, "Mate, can I do a rap?" He's, "What? What do you want? What are you on about?" I said, "I'm a rapper," and I started rapping in New Zealand. He went, "Oh, you're good." I went, "Yeah." He went, "All right, let me get you on the mic." I'm up, and it was like hip hop, uh, hip hop style vibe, go go, and all that. And then um, um, I went back about a year later, end of '85 early 86 mm. and I've gone back and, I, and he was DJing with Eddie Richards and I've gone in do you remember me he went no I went oh, I was here about a year ago and I was rapping on it and, uh, and he's, he's gone oh yeah I remember you that was good that was I went yeah do you want me to have another go he's gone yeah but I'm playing house at the minute um, I, I'll slow it down in a while I said no well I don't rap on hip hop anymore I rap on house and he's gone no one raps on house I'm like no I do uh, I said, you know, you remember it from me from last time. He's like, yeah. I said, well, I'm rapping about jacking your body now. He's gone, really? I went, yeah. I said, what you got lined up? He's gone, this brutal house nitro deluxe. Oh, yeah. So I've gone, all right, go on. Yeah. I'll get on that. I'll get on that. He was all right. Then he brought me in, gave me the microphone, started the tune. So I've just started rapping about jacking your body and all the rest of it. Place went absolutely shit, batshit crazy. And that was when I was just making that transition into only rapping on house music in 1986. I just made that switch. I just got bored with the sort of fat gold chain vibe and yeah. started to get a little bit like a little bit angry 
And you're, you're, you're right actually, because that was a time I started to get into the house as well. Because like yeah. tracks like you know House Nation, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. J J Jack the Groove, Fa finally Steve Jack Silk Curly, yeah, finally yeah, Jack, Jack Master Jack Fun, your body, yeah, exactly. All love can't turn around. Love can turn around. I mean, I these out. Oh, Chicago House was coming through. It's amazing. And yeah, wasn't it was. And, and do you know, day. Rich? Do you know what it was? I think it reminded us of like some of the early electric stuff we used to well it did to. i think i think that was one of the things for us i mean like london has always been the music capital of the world i, I think disco was bigger here than it was in new york just in the same way house music is bigger in london than it is in chicago and it was back then as well you know like all this like new early music was coming through but like you know it was also with house music like disco was becoming electronic and you got stuff like for an example serious intention mm. by serious intention you don't know so you don't know it's house it's house music, whatever you call it. It's got the stab that then, Tom Terry, like, like it was. It, it was just called dance music. <coughs> Things like uh, you know David Joseph, you can't hide your love, and all that kind of disco that was gone electronic as well. So and because electro was already very much in into play, it only had to stick a four four on it, and there and there you had it. And Detroit started doing that early doors, you know Warren Atkins with Clear, Cybertron that was 1983. Amazing, yeah. Was Cybertron was another one that like early electro. Yeah, that was 1983. Warren Atkins, and you yeah. can hear it all the way through his Model 500 stuff, like all that the early Detroit stuff started coming out in 1986. Metroplex, Transmat, uh, all them, you know. That's absolutely wick wicked era. And did, did you did you get like the Acid House as well? Uh, right? Absolutely. I mean, that was all. That was an evolution of it, wasn't it? I mean, you obviously like you know you got the house music started, and that all started kicking in. And, then, and you had techno, and ga you had garage. Was garage and house was the first phase. Garage being from New York, like your stuff like on your Jump Street label and Easy Street Records, and then the house was more your Chicago stuff. But you know, all, all of a sudden you had things like Sleazy D came along and it was Acid House, was like, oh, mm. hold on a minute, mm. and um, obviously uh, um, uh, DJ Pierre and Future, Acid Tracks, um, you know, all of a sudden there's these tunes coming through that are called Acid, and that was all part of the same thing for us, so yeah, it was like immediate, love it, love it, Acid and House. What, what, what Acid House clubs was you going to, was you going like, like Shum or any of them? Oh yeah, I went to Shum, um, I trip, went to Shum, trip, trip well, well I only went to Shum when, uh, when Colin Favour was playing, and, mm. and, and, and Kid Bachelor, and I'd go and I'd MC, I'd be the rapper for them at that, at that, that in 87 um, and 88 but we was like you know doing our own thing like I started my own nights in late 87 called Fantasy and I did them just in Upper Holloway a couple of house parties mm. and then I moved it in, in early to, uh, 88 February beginning of February 88 moved it into uh, Mondays into the HQ in Camden Lock and uh, did it every other Monday in there for a few for a few months with Eddie Richards, Colin Faber, Kid Bachelor, and that was the beginnings of it for me as a promoter, putting on a proper club night like early '88. I believe that was the first straight acid house club in London. I had all the strobe lights going off and all that. I don't think I think it was before Spectrum, uh, but it was obviously there was you know hedonism had happened. Um, I, I late 87 over in Hanger Lane uh, that was probably the very first Acid House Club but I was doing Fantasy there before Spectrum and all that um, at, the, at the HQ um, and with Eddie and Colin and Kid and you know flyers were a huge part of promotion weren't they oh so, flyers were huge yeah it so was the did, only way to promote so did you who was you know who was designing your flyers I mean Eddie Richards girlfriend Geraldine at the time she did my flyers for Fantasy and we did them a lot of this transparent acetate uh, flyers with like really lovely they were um, so we did, yeah, they were the flyers that I did, but Geraldine used to do all our flyers because she was a great artist and used to get them all printed up in Milton Keynes, which is where Eddie lives. Um, so yeah, she used to do all of our flyers for us back then. And have you, have um, you got but, a few... But, Rip, but then Rip, when Rip started, because I met Paul Rip, he came to Fantasy in HQ, like searching out Kid Bachelor. Hmm. He said, like, and he said to me, oh, like, I'm not going to poach your DJs, I want to book you, like your DJs. I'm like, oh, I, I'll, I'll DJ as well then. And he's gone, oh, I didn't know you was a DJ, I thought you was just a rapper. I'm like, well, I'm a DJ, so, you know, if you want to book the whole crew, book the whole crew, and he booked us, and we did, that was when Rip started. There was two parties in, Ever in Eversholt Street, I think it must have been April, 88, a um, couple of parties in Eversholt Street, and then and then moved into Clink Street. London <coughs> Bridge. London Bridge. Mm. Uh, so that was the legendary Rip parties, that kicked off straight away, I was a resident DJ, and helped promote it that first day. 
we done the party and uh, Paul was a bit worried at two o'clock. I'd gone, don't worry, I'll go out there. I went out West End with a couple of my mates. Come back at four o'clock, the place was packed. We just blitzed everywhere with flyers. Hey, that's it now, that's it now, please. <laughs> Uh, and that started on Saturdays and after a month of that we started on Fridays as well because it was so busy Fridays was a transmission or acid transmission and Paul Rip did it with Lou and um, then Sundays towards the end of the summer <coughs> Zoo, it was full of animals by then so it was called Zoo Wow, now, yeah. clean, them Clink Street events were amazing weren't that they? That was the beginnings for me that yeah. was where the proper underground comes from it was 88, yeah, it weren't 87 you know, yeah we can always say this started and that was there and then that was there and that was that but Rave culture, that for me was the birth of it there. Clinch Street, yeah, we'd all had a jolly up at Edenism and we'd all had a jolly up at wherever in 86 and 87. And you know, I used to go to Pyramid in, eight, in 86, uh, Heaven with Colin Favour and Mark Moore and e &B, House music and techno all night long. Uh, but it was gay night and it wasn't rave culture, it was different, it was gay culture, so it was a little bit different. Uh, but you know, when rave culture really started coming through, thanks, thanks very much Paul Rip and Lou. Yeah, Paul Stone. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, they, they got that going. I was, you know, like I said, I was just happy to be a resident DJ and help promote it, you know what I mean? 100%. Um, yeah, way, way before the internet kicked off, you know, like one of the ways underground, you know, underground music and clubs were promoted by the pirate radio stations. Because they were the places where they was playing a lot of the underground music that, that the commercial stations weren't playing. So can you kind of tell me the importance of the pirate radio back in the early days? Uh, it, was, it was obviously a different, different story altogether with no internet. Um, pirate radio was always there for me as, for, as a kid. Like mm. if you go way back, we were going like even in the seventies. I mean, Radio Caroline out there, yeah. in, uh, uh, Radio Luxembourg on the boat, on the boat, and all yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like, I think Caroline was yeah. the first one, and then after Caroline was JFM. J jazz funk music, wasn't it? JFM. 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 And Invicta. Yeah, Invicta. Yeah, Invicta. And then, I, and they was playing soul funk, disco, some a bit of reggae. Yeah. And then, of course, you had um, Horizon. Horizon came, and then that became Solar Radio. And wow. LWR sprung up, and Kiss and FM Kiss. sprung up. Yeah. So it was all the. the and then, 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 then obviously it was always vital for us. I mean, you know, before I was in, into buying music, I mean, I used to sit as a kid, listen to JFM with my cassette player, wait for the DJ to stop talking and take the, take the tunes on my little ghetto blaster and like do it like that, uh, like to get my music like that. And then obviously once you start to get interested, you're like, okay, now I want to know. Now you hear a tune, you want to buy it, go down to Groove Records in Wardour Street and buy a record. You know, and now it's like, oh, now I've got one record, now I've got to buy another record. But yeah, the pirate radio stations were everything. And Did you have some favourite favorite DJs you, list, you used to listen to on the pirates? I, I used to have loads. I used to like, like you know, CJ Carlos, mm. CJ McIntosh, yeah. Froggy. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were so many. Obviously, Ron Tom and Jasper, who I was with MC4 before I was a DJ, were amazing. Um, yeah, there were so many that I loved. Uh, Gordon Mac, uh, back in the day, before he did Kiss and that, he was on Horizon and that, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah, there were loads of them, loads of them. And like, you know, rec record digging and, you know, sniffing, sniffing out your crop. You know what? What early uh, record shops? You know, was you was you digging? You said Groove Records. I mean, Groove yeah. Groove was a wicked little shop. Wasn't yeah, it? Groove Records was the first one for me where I'd get interested as a kid, mm. go down and you know buy a tune. Um, you know, I used to go to like HMV in our price as well, Virgin. Yeah. Check out the dance music sections there. Um, you usually you'd be tooled up with like information from the Pi Radio, so you go, oh, these ones, I want them, I want to get that one and that one, I want to get that tune and that tune. Yeah, but then, you know, I think Groove was was different because like when you go into Groove, like independent specialist dance music shop, you're hearing stuff as it's coming in off the boat. Mm. So now you're hearing it before the right of the pirate stations. So that was for me was a, like, hold on a minute. I could just stand in here all day <laughs> and listen to music, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, get, get, got a little bit like that, you know, go down to Groove Records and there, stand There was there. a vibe, when there were vibes yeah, in the record was, shops. Yeah, there was, there was. I mean, big shout out to Chucky as well, Chucky's, Chucky, yeah. uh, Chucky Rock. Yeah, Chucky, yeah. Chucky's tunes as well. Chucky's tunes, yeah. Uh, Fat Cat as well. Yeah, Fat Cat, Alex Knight Alex down there, yeah. and Dave, And, yeah. uh, you know, I was at my, or I did all my shopping, mostly, in uh, the vinyl zone. Right. Jazz, uh, uh, Jazzy M shop over in Putney. Fulham. Mm. Over there, I used to shop in there, like, but um, I used to shop everywhere. I started, I started off at Black Market in Darbley Street. That I used to be a regular in there. 
and then uh, well like I say for house music that is before that groove records and that and then um, our price down in Croydon I popped down to there saw Jazzy M and then that became Swag Records and then I ended up going to uh, like I say I was a regular Ozone uh, vinyl zone, vinyl zone had everything for me. House, deep house, acid house, tech, tech house, melodic techno, electro, absolutely everything. I'd go in there and I just, I used to spend hundreds and hundreds every week. Was you know? like a little, like a little kid in a I was, shop. I was greedy for it. I had, <laughs> I used to spend hundreds a week. I was by far the biggest customer. Was you, was, was you a final, was you a final touring, I go away touring, yeah, I go away touring for a month, two, two months or something. I come back and I'd literally have like two grand's worth of records sitting there waiting for. <laughs> Me, that would I've missed since I'm more, and they know I'd go mad if I did if I had something missing. I used to be a proper avid collector back he in He was the day. a proper junkie. Yeah, proper junkie. I've got I thankfully I've got over it. Proper vinyl junkie. Yeah, yeah. I did I got over it thankfully. And how you know, house music, you know, that really brought people together. No matter what colour, what religion, yeah. gay or straight, everyone was unified under one roof, dancing, listening to this pulsating amazing house music. And that sprinkled with a few other little bits and pieces on top, it was like a spiritual awakening. Well, I can't, it was, I guess, for the mainstream, that 1988, but for some of us, it came a bit earlier than that. That's like, you know, I swapped my my rap lyrics about jacking your body back in 86. Mm. Uh, released my first house record with Eddie Richards in August 1987. That was a year before the Summer of Love released my first house song so you wow. know for some of us we could see it was coming and we was working on it and pushing it as MCs and DJs and club promoters and stuff but yeah for people it was a spiritual awakening but like I say I, I was every Wednesday night at a gay night called Pyramid at Heaven mm. yeah, and like you know listening to Colin Favor you know Heaven yeah heaven. it was amazing and that was gay though and it was a gay night so and it was the same with Mud Mud Club mm. uh, you know uh, at Busby's with Philip, and, Philip Salon yeah, Philip Salon yeah, yeah. so it was you know it was a gay night um, uh, and then it started to creep in you know I think like I say hedonism was one of the first it was the first early warehouse parties that went alright I'm just going for it. house music all night long and then ed ed hedonism was you know right there right in 1987 at the very beginning of it all uh, I was honoured to play there and MC there as well over in Hangar Lane big warehouse party um, they, they did a couple of them in there um, but so yeah, it, it was an explosion, you know, um, ecstasy, like, like, you know, little white doves, love doves arrived, 20 quid a pop, and uh, people were just, all of a sudden, we wanted to listen to, everyone wanted to listen to this new kind of music, and listen to, uh, listen to, uh, listen to house music and take ecstasy. And you think about it as well, like, I can only talk about London, but... There was a club night on literally every single every night, night of the week. week. Yeah, it was. It was every night of the week. And, and, the, week, and the whole weekend. Yeah, I was out every night of the week before Rave. <laughs> I was going out. I was a milkman was my last job in 87 and 86. And I would do the round. Uh, like sleep all day, get up at night, have dinner and go out clubbing all night, every night of the week. Anyway, that was me. So when it all kicked off, I was like, woohoo! <laughs> that was Larry. Uh, but it was amazing. It was, it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, you, you know, if you kind of sum summed it up in a few, in a few a few words, or rave whatever. culture was able to capture the imagination of London's youth in a way never seen before, and of any movement that come before it, even the hippie movement and punk movement, nothing engulfed the UK and London the way rave culture did. And it's because we made the culture. Yeah, the music was coming out of New York and Chicago and Detroit, um, but it was London that made that culture. It was Britain that made rave culture. And the way that we went at it, like you say, it was seven nights a week. You'd be, you know, obviously Spectrum and Future and Land of Oz and, you know, every night there was something going on, and um, and also not not just just in clubs. I mean, we're talking about fields. Yeah, about the fields. Yeah, yeah. Well, that all came a little bit later, like yeah, '89. Yeah. You know, like you know, basically like... every single rave promoter that went in a field was at Clean Street in '88. <laughs> so mm. that was the beginning of it, and it went from there. Every single one of them, from I used to call him Tony Cost Inflator. So Tony Colston hater because all prices went up, didn't they? Once he started doing all these raves, all the prices went up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it went from there, and everyone went out, and all of a sudden you had all the big, 
uh, orbital raves going on from your sunrise and energy was one of the originals and the best and in the weekend world and then rain dance and all you know so many of them but uh, that, there, was, there, was, there was also some of the under some of the other stuff the other clubs like your um, yeah, well, what we was doing dungeons in leverage road i was gonna say dungeon that was yeah. our spot yeah we did uh, saturdays um bass and uh, voodoo and bass and then fridays was linden c with strictly rhythm and all with uh, not not the strictly rhythm parties the bouncing and all that um hypnosis it was hypnosis on a friday and bouncing with their off parties with their like that and yeah we were doing bass uh, uh, on the saturdays in there and it was madness 89 now 88 was when it all kicked off and it was all like well we all love this and by 89 we're all full on in the music started to get a little bit more refined by then as well it started to get a little bit more tell, tell, tell rich tell me about dungeons man i dungeons mean dungeons on leverage road Dunge dungeons was mental on leverage road just uh, just before the leverage road station mm. the station and it was underneath in his tunnels and his courtyard and there was a big big old boozer and that was all part of it and it used to kick off in there every friday and saturday that was kind of like you know, we did Clinch Street in 88 and Dungeons was 89. That was like the, where we continued with the madness. But then other little things started springing up as well. Mm. Uh, in East London, Runtings, was the Runtings crew in Bethnal Green sprung up. <coughs> little things like that, 88 car wash in South, South London doing its thing. I saw a rip at Clinch Street and that we were in North Londoners. We did parties around here, Benwell Road, Holloway Road, 313 Holloway Road, um, like Cali, King's Cross. Um, you know, we did parties all, all around Islington and that as well, for us, North London lot, but the South London lot were doing car wash and uh, Fabio and Groove Rider doing their thing over in the South South London as well. Well, it just it, it happened all at once, didn't it, in 88, it was just like bang. And also, back then, you know, London wasn't really that developed. I mean, there was still, you know, still a lot of warehouses. Oh, yeah, so London was a dump, uh, like, you know, like, like in the, all around Clink Street was all like derelict warehouses. Like King's Cross, there are like warehouses, you couldn't do that now, they're all loft apartments now. Uh, but yeah, there was loads of places you could just kick off the door and switch the electricity on and have a rave. That was the air all day long, mate. That was a, it was it was a ama it was an amazing time though. Amazing, it? yeah. Like even like my mate Jason, Jason Ed, he's a DJ as well. He lived in his house in uh, just near Camden Square. Mm. Right, and they, they moved out the house and they kept going in there and doing throw it, do it, having parties in the whole entire house because we knew everyone in the street and that. But not on a Rama lived over the road. Even they came in a couple of times. Do you know what I mean? And we just had it in there, like, and it was like a, like a nightclub and in and, and out. It was in a terraced house in the street. And it was all going off. And it was all going off. We used to do it all the time. The old Bill like. Uh, would come and we'd just fuck off and then like they did like they put one of those big uh, metal doors the council put a big metal door on we knew someone <laughs> at the council got the key cracked on, crack on again when the old bill comes to lock the metal door hey, cool, 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 do nothing. Yeah. Uh, so there's things like that going on in 88 west end lane police station mm. west end lane remember west end lane yeah yeah west end lane police station there's some mates doing that as well my mate tom tom and all that doing parties in an old old old, old bill station you know what i mean it was mayhem if you should get up to back then, you just wouldn't believe it. The scene was huge, wasn't it? Yeah, it was massive. I mean, it grew from like basically like a little seed, um, and then well, it look, just... everybody was into dancing anyway. Yeah. You know, yeah, we yeah. was all into disco, weren't we? We was yeah, all into yeah. electro, we was all into hip hop, we was all into red groove, we was all into dance. So what was going to happen? You know, electronic dance music was already there. We had first wave, elect new wave, you know, with all your visage and all that, the Pleasure Boys visage. And we, had, we already had craft work and new, new order and all that electronic stuff was all in the balance, wasn't it? It was only a matter of time, once house music came and that little white pill with a little dove stamp on it, that was it. <laughs> all the <old> game over. <laughs> Finished. Yeah. Yeah. But the, um, I was going to say as well, what, you know, was there kind of some kind of key tracks that would kind of get your juices flowing? You know, was there like around 88, 89? Loads. I mean, I'm being a DJ for me. I mean, could you, you know, give, me a, was... give me a sample? Give me a sample of some of them killer tunes. I mean, there were so many. I mean, your Voodoo Ray. Oh, you know, Guy oh, called oh, Gerald. Yeah. You know, as soon as you heard that, bang. Bang, 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 bang. People bang, would lose their bang, minds. Bang, that was bang, it. People bang, would lose yeah, their shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, if only we could sum it up. British Acid House, the first ever British Acid House tune, that uh, Voodoo Ray, uh, and he, you know, like, like all that sort of stuff. But you know, what people might find a bit commercial now. Promised Land by Joe Smooth. Oh, that meant everything to us. You know, it's all right. Sterling Land. Void and Paris Brightledge. It's all right. All right. It, all right. It's all, all right. right. CC Rogers someday singing about ending up half fired. Maybe 
you let me love you for tonight, Korea and all that. You yeah. know, like, but I like I, I like it deep. Uh, so I would always be digging for a lot deeper stuff as a DJ. So you know what the general people were liking were the big tunes that we were the ones that made them big. Mm. You know, like make you make you know make my body rock, Joe Manda and all that. You know, I, I'm in love, Shalor. Well, it was us that made those tunes big. What was that one? Like, move your body, move yeah, your body. body. Boom, 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 boom. There was loads of them, but like Marshall Jefferson and all that. Like, there were, uh, obviously DJ Pierre with Dream Girl, Fantasy Girl, Mystery Girl, Got the Bug, Future that he did with Spanks, Spanky. You know, all that stuff was yeah, pivotal. Uh, you know, the very first, all the first house music, Chip E. You know, he's all, always goes unmentioned, poor old Chip E. Brilliant, he's a mate, he come and worked with us at Plink Plonk for a little while, Chip E. Uh, back in the day, Adonis, you know, all that, you know, early doors. All amazing music, all that Chicago stuff, and then all the Detroit stuff started coming through, you, you know, uh, obviously Strings of Life, Rhythm is Rhythm. Oh, what a tune, uh, yeah. All that, all that sort of stuff, you know, and uh, uh, Kevin Saunderson, and like, you know, I just want another chance under the name Reese, and Rock, mm. Rock to the Beat, Reese and Santonio, Santonio Eccles, all that lot, you know, starting off that first wave out now. Um, Eddie Flashing Folks, amazing stuff he was doing back then, you know. That's um, it, Thunder. Yeah, Acid Thunder. That was that was more your Chicago mm. uh, stuff. But yeah, there was so much coming out of Detroit and Chicago. It was all, all kicking off. It just blew up, didn't it? Yeah, it blew up. Yeah. And um, you know, how, how did you get your name, uh, Mr. You know, C. Mr. C? Well, that's because I'm a Chelsea fan. Oh. Right, no, so basically, back, living around here as a kid, when everyone, you know, I mentioned earlier in the interview about CB radio, mm. everyone had one. So, like, you had, a, you know, had them in their cars or one for, one for, one for, for a copy. For a copy and yeah. So, you have to, used to have a, hand, a name, a silly name or a handle, as they call it. One was Sinbad. So, my, my, well, mine was Chelsea Boy because I wanted oh. to wind up all the gooners around here. Oh. So I called myself Chelsea Boy. And then when I got to 16 and I started to rap, I went, and there's me thinking I've grown up, oh, I've got the 50, I still hadn't grown up. Right, but there's me thinking 16, I'm growing up now. <laughs> right. Chelsea Boy to Mr. C. That's me, I'll have that. And you know, because as a rapper, you've got to have a stupid name, haven't you? So I forget, I go from one stupid name to another. And you're short in Chelsea to C? Yeah, Mr. C, from Chelsea Boy to Mr. C. Yeah, and that was it, that's how wow. it started. And it just stuck, it stuck, it was a rap bar, and then when I started DJing, there was already a DJ Mr. C in New York, but when I started, I was a rapper, and I thought, yeah, it don't matter, he's a DJ, I'm a rapper, we're different, he's a DJ Mr. C, and I'm the rapper Mr. C, and it was all, all, all right. And then all of a sudden I became a DJ, so then there was another Mr. C, there's about 30,000 Mr. C's now, <laughs> they're everywhere. No, <laughs> but there's, there's, the break, there's a breakbeat one, a hip hop one, a drum and bass one, I think they're everywhere. Exactly. As far as the eye can see, 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 Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, um, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the Shaman. I mean, yeah. you know, did you become a member of the Shaman? Well, uh, basically the uh, manager moved down to London in 1988 to get the band a record deal, mm. a publishing deal, recording contract and all that, and he stumbled across Clink Street. So he's like, oh, uh, look at this lot of nutters. Right? And uh, he, put, he loved it. He put on a couple of his own little parties in Stratford and Whitechapel, where I DJed for him, actually. And then uh, he got onto the band and said to the band, like, you're supposed to be a psychedelic band, you need to check out this acid house malarkey in London, it's proper trippy. So they'd come down and had a look and seen what we were getting up to with acid house and Detroit techno and all that, and Chicago acid and going mad and all that, and they were like, oh yeah, that's all right. So they could immediately change their blueprint from psychedelic rock sort of ish. They already had an electronic influence, but got Bam Bam on board to do a remix. You know, did Where's Your Child, Bam Bam. They got him straight away doing a remix. Eddie Richards doing a remix. Um, then they asked in 89, uh, the manager asked me if I wanted to do a rap. It was actually uh, the track Move Any Mountain had already been written. And um, co uh, Colin and Will had asked Paul Oakenfold to, to, to do the mix down on it. Mm. And he's gone, yeah, sweet, I'll do that. And they've gone, well, we want a rapper. And they've gone, well, look, Paul Oakenfold said, it was only really Mr. C. If you could want a house rapper, it was Mr. C. Fucking hell, yeah, what do we think of that? We go to Clink Street, Dungeons, we know Mr. C. Well, we know who he is. And asked Ch Charles, the manager, to ask me to do a rap on this tune called Move Any Mountain. And I thought, uh, it's a bit white sounding for me, but I like the tune. Uh, I like the lyrics, and the band was called The Shaman, and I thought, I thought that was novel, being that I'd read Carlos Castaneda's The Yak I Wear Knowledge and was into shamanism and psychedelic plant usage. So I thought, oh, look at that, The Shaman. 
um, Move Any Mountain, I was, my first song was about meditation and being able to do what you want through thinking about it. So it's all right up my street and I thought, you know what? It's fixed. I can add to this. It's fixed. I can add something. Mm. I can add to this. This is a good tune mm. and I can add something special to it. I said, I'll do it. If you let me do a house, proper house music remix instead of just this alternative nonsense. And they went, yeah, all right, go on in. And they let me do my house, my deep house music mix. And that was it, end of 89 that came out. And I was just the guest rapper and the guest remixer. And then uh, it was a cult tune all through 90. And then in 91, um, it, they got re-released. And it was like, okay, um, done redoing the video. And that in Tenerife and Will and Colin both asked me to get involved to join the band as a full-time member instead of just a guest vocalist. A lot of the tour gigs I was missing before that because they couldn't mm. pay me the money I would have to give up my DJ gig. They couldn't afford that money. You know, I was getting paid £200 a DJ gig back then. They were only offering me 50 softs. Do you know what I mean? It's like, sorry, mate, if you give me 200 quid, I'll give up my DJ gig. But there weren't that sort of money in it back then, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, like they asked me to come on board. I said, all right, look, if you, I come on board, I've got to be on a percentage of the band and a percentage of everything, and then I'll come and I'll do the gigs. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm part of the band then. And that was it. I joined as a full-time member. But sadly, right after the video shoot of Move Any Mountain, Will Sinnott died. I heard, um, yeah. Yeah, he drowned. He went yeah. swimming. There's an island right next to Tenerife uh, called uh, La Gomera. Mm. And uh, he was swimming with his girl. And uh, she got caught in the undercurrent. Very strong swimmer she was. Mm. And uh, she got caught and told him not to go out there. He disobeyed and went out. And uh, got caught in it and got dragged under. Bless him. And uh, that was almost... That, 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 must, that must have hit, hit you all very hard. It did. It did. Mm. It was very difficult. I got yeah. to know Will very well at that point. And it was particularly difficult for me in a way that none of my friends knew it. So it was a bit weird. Like the only... I was I was devastated and the only person I could talk to was maybe Colin or mm. Charles and I didn't really want to you know what I mean it was like you know I wanted to and none of my mates knew him because I'm from I'm a street kid from Holloway then you know they they were in part of the squat scene more kind of thing you know what I mean so it was different scenes you know and I, I wasn't really able to share my grief with anyone on it really and it was quite a difficult moment um, but but you know um, Colin got flooded with letters Mm. Uh, from fans saying like you know the the importance of the, the shaman as an information band uh, there wasn't any dance music or electronic music information bands there still isn't i don't think uh, you know talking about human evolution and uh, you know the, what all, all things about you know human development and meditation and all that um, you know i think we were one of the first well we were the first and it's, it's an important band the band the fans were like this has got to continue Colin asked me if I wanted, was, wanted to remain. I said, yeah, I'm up for it. Um, he asked uh, Plavka Lonak if she wanted to stay. She said no and went on to join Jam and Spoon. Mm. And uh, yeah, we, we cracked on, me and Colin. We was like, okay, we'll find another singer. Me and you would do it. Let's write, let's write another album. And we wrote Bostrom. And carried on writing information, sharing uh, human evolution and information with the masses. Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to say a, a big R.I.P. to Will Sinner as well. Yeah, uh, top man. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, really was a big, massive, massive presence with the shaman and a real spirit. He knew, he knew about how the world worked. He knew about Gaia and the goddess mind and the psychedelic experience and human evolution. He knew 100%. And he was the embodiment of that. Will, so big loss, big loss. Yeah, big R.I.P. Yeah, big R.I.P. Yeah. And Rich, uh, well, you know, what inspired you to to write uh, Ebenezer Good? It was Colin. I wrote the lyrics uh, to the verses. Yeah, that's what I mean, the lyrics. Colin, yeah. Yeah, he's hilarious, Colin. <laughs> now, it was basically, we was doing a synergy versus decadence at the town and country forum, Kentish Town. Mm. And um, we was out, like, you know, we'd done the party and all the rest of it. And we come out and we go out in the crowd afterwards, baseball capped up, <laughs> jeans and trainers, and we'll notice. <laughs> Go out in the crowd and have a laugh, right? And this geezer, black geezer, he's put his hands on Colin's shoulders. He's gone, oh, he's a good, he's a good. <laughs> and Colin's gone, yeah, they are, yeah, they are. And then we're back in the, back in the dressing room. Colin's gone, I mean, Rich, he's a good. I went, yeah, I know. He's went, yeah, he's a good, he's a good. I went, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> he's gone, he's a good, Richard. He's Ebenezer good. I said, what do you mean he's Ebenezer good? What is it? It's another song. He's gone, yeah. I said, what? He, he's gone, yeah, his name's Ebenezer, but his friends call him Ezer for sure. He's a good. He's Ebenezer good. I went, oh, that's, that's funny. So, so what's the song? He's gone, well, like, you know, you Londoners. He's like, yeah. He said, you always drop your H's, don't you? I went, yeah. He's like, you know, you say, he did it, didn't he? You know what I mean? You drop your H's. Didn't he he yeah. said, so write a song. Yeah. Why don't you go and write a song? I've got a challenge for you, Richard. Go and write a song 
and it's got to be about this geezer Ebenezer Good, right? And he's uh, he gets called Eza for short, right? But everywhere you say the word he, it's got to mean e as well because you drop your h so e this and e that right i'm like all right challenge on so it's like two songs one song is about this fictional character ebenezer good who's the life and soul of the party mm. and the other one is about e ecstasy so he's like that was he threw the gauntlet down and i went right i'm in so i wrote the, the, the verses for it um took them back to colin and he's like yeah let's change this and change that he's an intellect very colorful language our colin so he'd change a few things and i'd go back and write a few more bits and then we ended we ended up with the final draft we was pinned ourselves. We was <laughs> recording it. We was we were, we had the Fortress Studio uh, and uh, down in I know the Playground Studio down in Agar Grove, down in Camden. And we was down there writing all that music. We was recording recording vocals and we recorded the vocals. And I said to Colin that day we recorded the lyrics. I said this is the number one, you know. And he's like, you reckon? I went, yes. Like, just even from the naughty, naughty, from that alone, it's number one. Right, people are going to be all over it. And they, I said, they won't get it either. They'll get the verses. These are good. They'll get that. But they won't get the, the, the choruses. They won't get the verses. And they did. And so we had to explain it to them that he was either about ecstasy or he, if you drop the H in the, in the he. So that took a while to sink in, you know. Um, I, I think the only people that kind of understood it were people like me that were kind of out there clubbing. And yeah, kind of knew but even it, but clubbers didn't really get the verses. They thought it was just about this geezer. Really? Yeah, I think wow. well, there weren't many people that was said to I me. I knew straight away that. when I heard it. I knew straight yeah, away. Yeah, like because you know, with that, with the verses, it's every line, isn't it? You know, he's refined, he's sublime, he makes you feel fine. They're very much maligned and misunderstood. So it's relentless. It's the whole song. And the right. veras, the yeah. virulins. Yeah, virulins, yeah. Virulin skins. skins. Yeah, yeah. Salmon and trout, yeah. snout. It's yeah. you know, having a laugh with it. And I knew it was going to be a number one straight off the bat. And I think you know, it was lucky because. Um, Move Any Mountain was our first top 10 hit. And that paved the way, I think it was number six or five or something like that. And then uh, then the next year we came out with a Boss Drum album and I think uh, we got a number six or a five or four of Love, Sex, Intelligence. And that was the single before Ebenezer Good. So we was ready, it was primed. You know, we was ready to have that big one and it went in at number five or something and then up to number one. But bang, sat there for a month. And I uh, started ruining our release schedule. We had a boss drum to come out and then Forever People. Yeah. And then we wanted to bring Forever People out and go for Christmas top five. Mm. But if we if Ebenezer Good kept going, we wouldn't have been able to. We had to cancel it all. So we would have been so we deleted it. Fourth week of Ebenezer Good being at number one. We actually deleted it, becoming the first band in British pop history to delete a number one while still at number one. So it was our number one, number seventeen and gone because it was sold out, it was deleted. And then we was able to just get on with Bosch Drum. Uh, which got to top five, uh, and then uh, obviously uh, Forever People, which was our biggest selling single because Everybody's a Good was deleted, so that went on to outsell Everybody's a Good, and that got to number five Christmas week. Uh, it was nice being up there with like you know your Michael Jacksons and your Madonnas and all that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, what what a great album, Boss Drum. You know, it was what was the name? Album. What 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 come up? How did you come up with the name Boss Drum? Boss, well, it was funny because Colin bought a new drum machine called a Boss Drum. Oh. And that was what it was called. It was a boss drum. It's a boss drum. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that'd be a good name for an album. Because, you know, obviously shamanism is about drums and drum, the way drums change your brain waves from the normal beta state into alpha th and theta states, um, releasing serotonin. It's all shamanic. So that whole rhythm and that, you know, that was why the song Boss Drum was about activating the rhythm that's always been an archaic revival of sound. Um, so that was what it was about. But it was inspired by the drum machine came before the, uh, the, the boss, song. Yeah. The boss drum. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And what, what was studio time? You must have had a, an absolute laugh in the studio i mean yeah oh, we was just completely stoned the whole time <laughs> like just you know the amount of weed we went through was ridiculous <laughs> in the studio but yeah we had a great time being creative and yeah we, we had our little dabbles to help creativity as you would say yeah a little mind experience yeah no no it's it great we're very creative you know um being a meditator i was always very creative anyway in 92, 1992 was that's the first time i met you i was working for a record distribution company called pinnacle records yeah. in uh, alpington yeah and you know you started up this wicked uh, sort of electronic dance label called plink plonk can you tell me a little bit about Pling Plonk? Yeah, sure. Um, 1988, we have to go back to 1988 again, Clink Street. Right. And uh, I'm out of my night. I'm 
candy flip, someone acid and eating, you know, well, eyeballs rolling around my head. <laughs> and Kid Bachelor's on the decks, and he played The Way I Feel by Lil Lewis. Mm. And it's this beautiful tune from 87, it goes bong bong ga bong. 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 And I was hearing it, and I was just seeing all these shapes coming out of the speakers, and he was going plink plonk and all that. And I was like, plink plink plonk. And I couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, that's it, that's the name of a record label. <laughs> so that's, that, that was in 1988. I said, one day I will have a record label when I'm not a poor inner city Holloway boy and I've got some money. I'll make plink plonk records. And that was it, that was where it was born. Um, my girlfriend at the time, Becca, she actually wrote it plink plonk on one of her banners. Mm. And there it was. it was, it was real at that point. So it only took for me to earn some money from the shaman a couple of years later, a few or four years later in 92, get my first paycheck, uh, to start plink plonk records. And I did that with Paul Rip, who was the geezer who organized Plink Street. Right. The Rip parties, Paul yeah, Rip. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So me and him started uh, Plink Plonk Records together as a techno label, uh, acid house, acid techno, trippy label from London. And there wasn't many labels about it in its time like it. It wasn't any like it at all. It was very odd. Stood on its own with its sound, techno, uh, but m mellow, trippy techno, and with sometimes melodic and funky and housey techno. And I think that was probably the beginnings of Tech House. Back then, you know, tech house wasn't a genre then, but we had a we had plink plonk blue and plink plonk black, and the black was the tech and the blue was the house and it was tech house. Um, yeah, that was probably the, the birth of it. And did you uh, release like? Did you produce a record and release one of your records first on that label? Or yes, did I did. I mean, I'm uh, the first record we released on Plink Plonk was under the name of Somnambulist. Oh. And we used to use different names for different artists, and the Somnambulist was me and Paul Rip. Right. So it was me and Paul, and we recorded under that name a few times, and no one knew it was us. We no, didn't. I never knew that. No, that was me and Paul, the Somnambulist. Uh, we didn't tell anyone, and I was also Man Track. Um, I didn't tell anyone I was Man Track either. Wow. And I also recorded as Animus Amore with my mate Jai, and we recorded uh, like I was man, it was Man Track and Jai. Mm. So I didn't let people know who I was. I was kept you kind of un underground. Well, but that was what we did with Plink Plonk. Mm. Like you know, uh, we had like Derek Carter as Tone Theory. We had uh, Stacy Pullen as Cosmic Messenger. We had Roland McGinty from the Wooden Tops as Pluto. Wow. We had Ke Ian Tregoning uh, who engineered for Yellow as the Stranger. Wow. We had Bullet. Uh, we had uh, so Keith. Uh, Leslie Lawrence from Bang the Party was Bullet. So we had all like names, but we also had new names like Hijacker, mm. who was Megalon with Zeno. Um, so we had new names coming through Wild West. So, and because that nobody knew who anyone was, and like there wasn't any hierarchy on the name. Like, it was all about the music and it was all beautifully packaged. Mm. Shrink wrapped, all mm. 180 gram vinyl. So be all looked be be beautifully beautiful. done. Yeah. We didn't, I didn't spend any expense on promoting and marketing. We didn't self call, but I didn't care. I don't got my money from the shaman. And I'd always said, any money I make from pop music, I'm going to plow it into the underground. And it's exactly what I did. Um, I started Plink Plonk Records. I started the Watershed Studio in ben, Benwell Road, just around, by, around here in Ivory Holloway. Mm. Uh, Watershed Studio. Got all my mates to come and engineer for me, uh, like uh, to teach the kids. I had everyone coming in using the studio for free. Is it? And yeah, everyone used to wow. come in. Uh, Bushwhacker learned in there. Um, you know, uh, Danny Mancini learned in there. Uh, like lots of people coming through making music. And if it was good enough to release, I put it out on Blink So you was kind of giving it back oh, to the yeah. community. Well, that's what I said. It was. A, yeah. It was for the community. I never charged. Yeah. I only charged if I released their records. Yeah, yeah. And then took it out of the money that come from the record, or whatever. I let everyone to crack on in there. That that was it, I was just giving back, that was what it was about. It was a studio for the community, As a, you know, that was what I come from. And I, you know, I didn't buy an house, I didn't buy a flash car. I set up a studio and started Plink Plonk and carried on with what I was doing, living how I was living, because that was for me where it was at. You know, it weren't about, about the money, it was about the, the underground uh, underground dance music. And like Paul, Paul Rip, Paul Stone, he was mad enough to have the same sort of vision with underground music, absolute lunatic. So I knew he wouldn't sell out. So between us, we had this partnership that was next level and, you know, made one of the finest labels that ever existed. And that's a really nice thing for you to do to bring, you know, bring sort of the younger generation in to do a bit of music production. I've always done it. I did the same with the end label of Pre Preble, and I'm still doing it now with Super Freak. 
I like, I'm still bringing in young artists and first time releases and all that and using it as a platform for development. I know every, like, I could get all my mates to do, like, all, like, all the big name DJs, I could easily get my mates come and do, do us a remix, do us a tune, do, do, do. I don't, I, I, get, I use the label as a platform for new talent and our crew will do the remixes and we'll keep it underground and that's why Super Freak doesn't sound like any other label out there. It's not generic in any way, shape or form. And what, what better way is there, Rich? To, 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 it's, the, it's the only way I know. We did it with Plink Plonk, we did it with End Recordings, with The End, and we did it when I'm doing it now with Super Freak. I don't know any other way. But, but what I mean is, what, what other better way is there to spread, you know, positivity with the younger oh, generation yeah. well, than music, create, creating music? Music is the soul of the universe. It is. What, 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 you know, how, how depressing and sad would this world be without music? It's, it, 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 I couldn't imagine it. I mean, it's saved yeah. so many lives. Yeah. It saved so many of us. You know, I'd have been in and out of jail if it weren't for music. Do you know what I mean? I'd probably be dead, a, a junkie, in, or in and out of jail. Uh, as many friends have been and have, that I've lost. And, you know, music saved me. And, you know, like any time you're feeling shit, you don't want to do, do any emails, you don't want to talk to no one, you've got your black dog is on your shoulder. Put on your favourite disco record and turn yeah. it up, right? And I bet you feel alright after five and minutes. Have, have, and a have, little, have a little dance. Have a dance, sing yeah. at the top of your voice along. It's the replay, it's the replay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Put, get, get your first best five favourite tunes on YouTube, turn them right up. And have a dance about in your bedroom and your and it living room. You, it? It sorts it you right that. out. So yeah. Music is there to, is to heal us. And you music know, is our life. It's a it's a healing as well. Mm. Frequency and sound heals. Yeah. Frequency is is it? We're all made of frequency, and it's so whether you know everything is made of frequency. It's just atoms. It's frequency so, going on there in this cave. Atoms surrounded by a mm. proton and a neutron, a neutron and an electron, mm. vibrating at certain frequencies, and mm. those frequencies give us the illusion of solid objects and sound. Mm. Sound is a healer. Sound is, is, is a healing thing. It really, it really is a healing yeah. thing. And in terms of healing, healing sounds, you know, could you give me like a selection, not just house music, but a selection of music throughout the years that would kind of, you know, it would kind of get you up there and think, wow, this is like, this blew there's, me there's away. So, there's so many. There's so I mean, many. There's I so like, many. Oh. I mean, like, you've got to go back to Bob Marley, mm. you know, Kaya. Got to have Kaya now. I've got to have Kaya now. For the rain is falling. Oh, 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 I feel so high. I even touch the sky above the falling rain. So he's singing about getting out of his nut. That's what we've all done, isn't it? For all those, you know, that's what we do. And it's like the music has been part of that. And I think, you know, there's so many songs from soul, mm. like, you know, so much beautiful soul music and disco mm. and funk and mm. rare groove. Jazz, you know, I'm a big fan of John Coltrane. Mm. You know, uh, I like Miles Davis. I'm a big jazz fan, so you know, there's lots of stuff that you know just, just blows your mind. And you listen to it, you know, and you can go right back to classical music for that. But I'm a big fan of jazz and, and jazz influences in in all sorts of music, be it funk, soul, disco, reggae. You know, I like that minor fifth, minor seventh. Uh, you know that that feeling, and that feeling that touches your touches your spirit, touches your soul, it's, it's touches your soul. Yeah. And I find that in minor yeah. chords, and uh, everyone's different. Uh, you know, major chords are the more hey up in the air, ends up in the air, and all that. And people like all that. You know, that's mm. what's more commercial. Doesn't really do it for me as much. I prefer. I like it. You know, obviously everyone wants to put their everyone wants to put their hands up in the air and jump about like that. Was, but I like that depth and that warmth and that mm. you know go that down. Really there. kind of soulful. soulful and it's, it's healing. Music has always been a healer it's mm. the soul of the universe and it's there you know to pull us out of hard times it's helped us to celebrate hard times as well you know those love songs where you just break up your girlfriend you sit there sobbing your heart out mm. you know you've got to go through it. it's part of our healing isn't it and going back to the hip-hop thing I mean hip-hop kind of introduced us uh, it didn't introduce us but it got us more into that kind of funk sound because hip-hop records were sampling a thing called the break yeah yeah, so was well, I was into the original funk, so that was me. So when you, you know, people started sampling "Funky Drummer" by James Brown and stuff like that, these break beats from like the Headhunters and these obscure break beats, mm. they all started sampling them and using them, and they still do it today. Uh, I, I think it's great. I like hip hop music. I love the way they put they put it together. I love it. Especially now, it's getting more electronic and minimal for me. But like you know, like I say, I'm a, I'm a soul boy. I was brought up on soul. You know, and my favourite funk album, soul album is um, Gwen Guthrie and the Padlock album. 
Mm. Uh, mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. My, my, my favourite album of all time is Specials by the Specials. My favourite electronic album would be uh, Temple of Transparent Balls by the Black Dog. Oh. And amazing, totally psychedelic. Yeah. Totally psychedelic. So, you know, I'm into all sorts of music, really. And, Rich, you also um, own the, the club called The End. Correct, yeah, um, The End with, with my partner Leo and his father, who's a third three way partnership, and uh, his sister Zoe Paskin run it. But yeah, I was one of the founding owners of The End, yeah. So, how did that come about? You know, you uh, owning The End? Well, that Leo's dad. Douglas, he got permissioned to turn this into this space into some sort of an event space. Well, he was asked about it, mm. about doing it, and Leo saw it and said, "Oh, I don't know, can we do it?" And Leo's dad said, "Don't be stupid. It cost us a million at least to do it." And he was talking to my mate Paul Unique, uh, Paul Francis, DJ Unique, and he said to Paul, "Like, yeah, about doing something, doing it." And he said, have you, "Paul said, have you spoke to Richard?" And he went, "No, I haven't." He said, "Well, I think you need to speak to Richard. If anyone's going to be able to do something like that, it's Richard." Uh, so he spoke to me and I went and had a look and uh, there was all these tunnels, there was three tunnels like that, <laughs> which was the main two with the dance floor and then the third one the toilets. Yeah, yeah. But the, the tunnels were like at shoulder height, they started going up so I was like, you know, you'd have to excavate down a couple of metres to get the height we needed, which they did, that's why the dance floor goes down in the end. Mm. Um, but yeah, I looked at it, I said, yeah, I, 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 we, I'd get, I'm up for it. And he's gone, well, how are we going to get the money? I said, well, look, I, I'll put my money up. I'll put some money up. And I can get people put money up. Um, you know, let's put some money up. We'll, you know, um, sit, have a word with the banks. The bank said, look, whatever you put up, we'll give you the same. So we managed to scrape together half a million or something, a bit less, a bit less. And the banks give us the same. And we went and went, fuck it, let's do it. And built it. So we just blagged it. <laughs> blagged it, did it. Black, got blagged, blagged, blagged. Still, black. still boy style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, you know. fortunately, um, I I was on Kiss FM with a weekly show. And, you know, I was one of the people that were instrumental in building rave culture from the ground up in England and in London, especially. So doing a London club with the right people, mm. I, I, was in, I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, at yeah. the right age, I was 29. The young for a club owner, I guess, back then. But it was like, Leo was only 26, and it was like, okay, let's do it. It's a club set up by clubbers, four clubbers, no expense spared, um, sound system, the best, the best in the world. You didn't get better distribution of the mids and high ends than the sound, uh, than the Thunder Ridge X2000. And that was what we did. Um, we set that up, and uh, you know, it was difficult at first. The underground London went to warehouses. We didn't go to posh clubs in the centre of London. So it was difficult, but we stuck with our guns. We didn't sell out, we didn't go cheese. We stuck with underground house, acid, techno, drum and bass, breaks, whatever, went and pulled it off. We pulled it off. And um, you know, when, when Chloe's sister got involved, um, started running things for us, it started to run the business properly because me and Leo weren't getting it right. Mm. Uh, but yeah, and, and then it went from there and it just went up and up and up and up and up. And, you know, became got better and better every year. Year on year, got better and better, and it was the best club in the world, bar none. And who, who were some of the DJs you had passing? We through? had everyone. I mean, we had like I had my own residency, um, a subterrane, and then when I split up, that was Leo and Bushwhacker were the warm, small DJs in the back little room. But then they blew up with Love Story, so we started their night um, all night long, mm. and I changed from subterrane to Super Freak, and then but we had uh, Lauren Garnier was a monthly resident. Uh, bought by monthly resident Derek Carter with Classic Records was resident Darren Emerson with Underwater was resident with Sven Vaff with Cocoon was resident Wow We had everyone in there from Carl Cox to Wow You name it, everyone who was good We had Ram Records and Andy C We had LTJ Bookham and doing residency with uh, Promised Land and we had all sorts in there uh, Metal, uh, not Metalheads um, uh, I can't remember, drum and bass nights, you know, mm. we had everything in there, uh, we had a fantastic uh, gay night, DTPM, which ended up leaving us for Fabric, they went for the big bucks, but Fabric paid them off to leave us, mm. and so they took the bucks and then killed their own night in doing it, unlucky their loss, but that gave, that inspired us again to take a step up, uh, the end just got better and better every year, and uh, we closed it in January 2009 as the best club in the world, and it will always remain that legendary. Oh. And Rich, what was the main reason it shut down? We could, it was, we we got an offer we couldn't refuse. Um, you know, the building had been bought out a couple of years before um, by a property developer, and he wanted to build a luxury apartment blocks on it. 
and uh, they needed our face of it. It was listed, grade A listed building, so they couldn't knock the whole thing down. They had to keep that face. Mm. And that was where our club was, so they had to use that for their entrances and all the rest of it. And they offered to pay us out, and we're like, no. And they put the rent up within the law, and we just paid it. We wrote seven nights a week, so we're like, okay, whatever, we just pay it. And um, then they said, okay, like it was eight years before, uh, it was 2008, July 2008 to be precise. And um, the, the new owners said, look, you've got eight years left in January on your new lease, on your lease, and we're not going to renew. That will be it. You've got eight years left. We'll give you eight years profit at your best year, which was the year before, 2007. Mm. We'll give you eight years profit at your best year to leave now. So do we just work for eight years and maybe earn that or maybe not, or just take the money and not have to work for it? Obviously, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Um, and a month later, the credit crunch kicked in. Yeah, you couldn't done, have been done, better. Couldn't done, have been better. Couldn't have been to better. perfection. Couldn't have been better. Yeah, but it's a shame though losing clubs like that because like the clubs like the End, Turmills, yeah. Astoria. You know, there were some incredible Bagley's. You know, there were some amazing. Yeah, clubs but in London, London always reinvents itself, doesn't it? You know, now you've got Beams and you've got SE. You've got that E1 amazing club E1. You've got Fold. You've got the True. Cores. True. You've got new clubs springing up left, and, works. left and right. Print Works. Yeah. yeah, they're now Beams now, and they Print Works is closing down. Yeah. So you know, one springs up, one one door opens, another one closes. It's true. You know, like I'm doing a Super Freak at the week, uh, at New Year on New Year's Day with uh, uh, the lovely little place that holds 300 people right underneath Water, underneath Waterloo Station called Ores and they've got a few little clubs down there that's amazing it's oh, yeah. great, and if, you, if you're down, down there, there check there, out yeah. the artwork so, you know, the London will always keep reinventing itself that's what London does that's what we that's what us Londoners do and uh, you know I've just moved back after 13 years away I'm getting stuck in mate <laughs> yeah. you, you ain't holding back no you? I'm getting stuck right here we've got End Reunion on March the 11th sold out within 24 hours it's wow. at Coco in Camden ex Camden Palace that's Camden a big Town. venue as well isn't it yeah big venue yeah sold that out in less than a day wow. um, so I'm going to be doing my underground parties I've got some good things planned for the summer some bigger stuff and I've got my manifest festival happening so I'm not mucking about I'm getting involved and the thing, the thing on um, New Year's Day, uh, how do you get tickets for that? Because anyone watching, I'm going yeah, to... well, it's limited. Uh, you have to be quick. It's uh, Skiddle. Yep. You go to Skiddle. Dot, dot, dot com and uh, go on there and put Super Freak New Year's Day Ball. I've got uh, the legendary Colin Dale joining in. Wicked. Um, Our Colin also... as well. If Colin's watching this, I need to get you in the cab for an yeah, old school chin wag. Colin in the cab. Top Colin. Pizza. Colin, so yeah, we've got the legendary Colin Dow, we've got Omid 16B, a load of records, uh, Dutchie from Delicate Droids, uh, Miss C, uh, who's our resident, and uh, Broken Neon, actually, no, they've just cancelled me, I've got to replace Broken Neon for the warm up, but, and my good self, of course, so it's a proper lineup, and we're going to have a lot of fun there, New Year's Day, 4 pm, and we'll go through till 1 o'clock in the morning. That, that'll be absolutely They wicked. will be special, yeah. And um, basically, you know, at, at, you know, throughout the years, Rich, you know, what, what's been some of the sort of the, your biggest highlights so, so far? So many highlights. I mean, like headlining Glastonbury in 1993, after having Ebenezer Good as a hit and all the rest of it, mm. um, that, was mad, that was madness. Uh, you know, 70,000 people in front of us headlining on the Saturday night on the enemy stage. The, big, the bridge broke into the field, there was so much pandemonium going on. Wow. And we formed a telepathic community that night. My mind blew my own mind. <laughs> it was, <laughs> <laughs> was proper mental. Uh, I'll never forget that. Um, the first time I did Top of the Pops with Move Any Mountain, I was having trouble not laughing. I'd visualised it um, a few years before. Um, and uh, I was in, actually, I, I was inside in Wellingborough. And I visualised it, and it, when it actually happened six years later, I kept it was trying. It was making me giggle. It was exactly as I visualised the inside of the studios at the top of the pops. So that was a bit of a weird one for me. One of the big, big periods. But so many things headlining, um, the, like various concerts and festivals, like pop, pop, hundred thousand people with Glaston, uh, with the Shaman, um, to doing like amazing DJ gigs in the best clubs in the world from Space and Amnesia and Pasha in Ibiza to, you know, like Tokyo, uh, Yellow Club back in the day, Womb, uh, you know, Zook in Singapore, some of the best clubs in the world. I was lucky enough to play at Twilo in New York and um, good clubs around your Pasha in Buenos Aires and uh, Sobramonte in Punta del Este in Uruguay. 
and some of the best clubs in the world, The Edge in Sao Paulo. And, you know, I'm really fortunate that I'm still doing it. I'm able, able to play in the best clubs around the world and to amazing people and amazing souls that want to come out and celebrate life. And you know what? Every month there's a new favourite. Is there, is there a, like a little message that you want to send out to all your, you know, basically your, your fans, I suppose? You yeah, know? go out and support your local DJs. You know, like the underground is. That's where the roots is. That's where it comes from, and they need your support. You know, you know, and you know. Imagine when you they blow up and you go, yeah, I was there when he was no one, mm. supporting really good music. And the underground needs your help. Yeah, like people that put on underground parties, they do it for love. They do it for passion. Support your locals. Support your local promoters. Support your local DJs. Yeah, no, hundred percent, man. Support, support, and support. Yeah, support, support, support the up and comers. And support your black cabs as well. Yeah, yeah support your black cabs. <laughs> and uh, Rich, you know, how, how can people, you know, get in touch as well? Well, for getting in touch, I mean, it's, it's, I'm quite easy to get in touch with. Um, yeah. I'm on all the socials as Mr. C, MRC Super Freak. Is it, my URL is forward slash MRC Super Freak. Um, so you can get in, find me everywhere Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, all over the gap, YouTube, the lot. And do you want to give a little uh, little shout out to anyone? Oh, uh, yeah, do I want to give a shout? Not really. Um, uh, I'm happy to be back in London. I've only been back less than a couple of weeks. And well, we're glad, we're glad like, to have you my back. My feet ain't touched the ground. I haven't stopped working since I've gone here. So I'm, I just want to say I'm happy to be home. I uh, give a lot of love to all my family and friends and everyone that's welcomed me and helping me settle back in. Big up all of you lot. Need you right now. And it's a bit of a transition I'm going through again and we're having it. Oh yeah, having a, having a big, having nice a big one. time. Yep. And uh, Rich, what can I say? Absolutely amazing interview. Ah, uh, lovely to be on board, mate. I hope you kind of enjoyed it. It's all pretty chilled in the yeah, back. Yeah, I'm the enjoying country. it. Yeah, it's always, it's always good. You know, it's like his his story, isn't it? History. That's what it is. Is it? You know, someone's story. Everyone's got a story to tell. And when you can get people's stories, and you know, it helps piece together the jigsaw of uh, the the, ta the tapestry of life, as they say. So you know, every story is it all adds up, and uh, you know, it's good to be get a little bit of history out there. Why not? 100% mate and anyone watching this as I say from the start share this around the socials check out my other interviews with Public Enemy, Man Parish, uh, Jay Strongman, Rocky Look. Express 2 I mean basically yeah. everyone who's only was took his time to get me on it that's what you're trying to say <laughs> you know, moon. and I've got to say a big shout out to my man Chucky Rock as well from yeah, Tonka man. big up Chucky big up Chucky one of the best my, my, he's probably arguably my top five people in the world on the, in, on the internet he just says it proper. Chuck is wicked. Yeah, proper. And um, proper I've got to say as well, big up to all my subscribers and let's have um, a, I try to have a positive, peaceful 2023 as well. Yeah, you know what they say, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be important and that, but it's more important to be nice. You don't know what anyone is going through out there, do you? No. You know, no. you don't know what, what what what's happened to people that morning or the day before. You really don't. And they might be on the edge and you being, a, well, most people go over the edge and you giving someone a smoke, hey, good morning, how are you? You know, smile. It'll make their day. Make their day. Yeah, Cost yeah. nothing to be kind. 100%. Part of my French by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well Rich listen it's been an absolute honour. Real pleasure. Absolute honour and we're glad to have you back in uh, back in London as well. Good to be back and uh, in one of London's lovely black cabs. Exactly the, I the iconic. Yeah. But Rich absolute honour. No, it's my pleasure. Bro. Okay my man. Peace from the South East. Love and out. <laughs>